Today on Education Forum, executive function, what is it and how does it relate to disabilities? From the studio in the College of Education and Health Professions at Columbus State University in Columbus, Georgia, this is Education Forum with your host, Dr. Jeffrey T. Conklin. Welcome to Education Forum. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in, but before we get started today, I'd like to say that I've had several comments from people that have been watching the show, and they really like the new set we've got, and I'd like to thank Dr. Baltimore and his crew for putting together such a great new set and the furniture we have here. And now I think we'll start with Education Forum. First, let me introduce my guests. To my right, Dr. Brahanatan Keskin is an assistant professor of early childhood education in the College of Education and Health Professions here at Columbus State University. Welcome, Dr. Keskin. Thank you very much. Also with me today is my co-host, Dr. Gregory Blaylock, assistant professor of special education at Columbus State University. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Jeff. Now that we've met our panel, I think it would be a good idea if we took a look at a little video to talk about executive function so you, we can lay that foundation. So that sets the stage a little bit. So, Brahanatan, can you give us a broader definition of executive function? Sure. Executive function refers to a set of high-level cognitive functions that regulates and control other abilities, such as ability to initiate behavior or ability to stop a behavior, ability to plan a future behavior, or manage your time and other uh, things. Okay, okay, so can you tell us how high level cognitive functioning and low level cognitive functioning are and how they're related to executive function? The definition of uh, executive function implies a distinction between high level cognitive functions versus low level cognitive functions. When we talk about high level cognitive function, we are talking about abilities that involve uh, uh, evaluating and some other type of high level 
abilities, such as when you evaluate, you have to uh, monitor the environment and come up with your own conclusion. Uh, in the low level cognitive functions, they are usually referred to skills such as mother skills or auditory or visual sensations. Okay. So the executive function regulates the other lower level functions. Okay. All right. Now, what about uh, such things as automatic and controlled actions, and how are those related to executive function? Well, if I could jump in, I think, okay. um, yeah. you know, in, in cognitive uh, science, we uh, kind of think about um, two different types of actions. We've got automatic actions uh, or automated actions, and okay. then we have what we call control actions. And automatic, automatic actions are, uh, are those actions that are habitual. Uh, right. in nature. There are things that we do that we don't really even think about doing. For instance, uh, many of us can relate to driving to work in the morning and getting to work and not really realizing how we got there. We, the drive-in is something that we do so often that it's a habitual thing. During the drive, we're able to multitask. Okay. Um, okay. We're able to do the drive without actually even thinking about it. Um, contrast that with what we might call controlled actions. Uh, and controlled actions are those actions that actually require us to think about uh, uh, doing it in order okay. to carry it out. Okay. Uh, they require um, uh, some, some planning, mm -hmm. they require some flexible thought as we're carrying out the action, uh, some real concentration if you will. So getting back to our example of driving into work, mm -hmm. um, we, can, we can turn that habitual or automatic uh, process or action into a controlled action uh, if it starts raining very hard ah, on the way okay, in. Okay. Or if it starts okay. snowing, suddenly now uh, what was a leisurely drive becomes a drive where you're uh, concentrating on the roads, you're blocking everything out. You might actually turn the radio down so that you can concentrate on, on your driving and concentrate on where everybody else is on the road. So you're going from an automatic function at that point or an automatic action to a controlled one. Absolutely. Where you have to cognitively think about it. Think about it, okay. absolutely. Okay. And so, so when we talk about executive functioning, uh, I, think, I think that's more of a, just a general umbrella term okay. Uh, okay. for this, uh, uh, for controlled action. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I also would like to make a comment on this. Uh, when we talk about higher level cognitive function versus lower level cognitive function related to automatic versus control action. Mm -hmm. Just because something is automatic, it doesn't mean that it involves only lower level cognitive functions. Okay, okay. So for example, exactly, like yeah. a driving. Okay. If I am driving from my home to my school or other places, it involves high level of thinking because you have to be paying attention to the road, the traffic lights and other things. All right, right. you uh, have to be in the moment. You yes, in the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even though it involves high level of thinking, it can be automatic. So. Okay, okay. So we have to make a distinction. Another distinction we should make is just because we made the separation between high level of uh, cognitive skills versus low level of cognitive skills, it doesn't mean that low, we don't really uh, need the low level of cognitive function. Okay. These are the okay. functions that feed the high level cognitive functions. So they are the foundation okay. of our mental structure. Right. So, so, th so it's not like they're any less important. No. Because See, we call uh, them okay. low and high. Right. Yeah. It's nothing right. to do and with And that's an yes. important yeah. distinction to make. Yes. yes. I, I think when we go, when we think about the video that we have seen yes. at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, there the, the person gave an example of a symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, think about a symphony orchestra full of very skillful musicians. Uh, individually, they can do a great job but right. if there's not a good conductor, then the resulting sound may not be considered as music because it is going to be most likely a chaotic okay. noise, mm -hmm. which you cannot call music. The same thing, you may have really good uh, lower level cognitive functions and you can function at that level very well. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the chief executive functioning that rules, governs and organize these functions, then you will be in trouble in You'll terms of chaos. Yes, the okay. chaos, mm -hmm. mental chaos, which will result in actual chaos in your life. You know, we'll have to talk about that a little bit as we go along, but sure. I think, you know, we still need to talk about, you know, how important 
or what is the relationship with executive function and child development? Okay, uh, it is a very important topic for okay. numerous reasons. The, the most important to me is because it is when, when you are born, mm -hmm. you don't come with uh, developed executive functioning. Okay. So it's something that a child develops. From day one? Yes, okay. from day one. Okay. Even at the day one, it is the executive functioning level is quite low because the baby cannot really uh, control his or her behavior. Mm, much of anything. At yes. This right, okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, at the beginning, it is not really at a good point but later on with maturation it evolves and develops and becomes more mature mm -hmm. executive mm -hmm. function. Okay. So because the baby develops it, it is very important to a developmental psychologist because they ask the question, when does this develop okay. and how does it develop? The more we know about when this executive functioning develops and when and how it develops, it makes us more enabled to discover the truth behind it and then help children to function in the, not only in classroom environment but also in regular social life. In life, yes, okay. Now, properly. does it go through stages? Do you see definite stages like you do with other child development? I mean, at the beginning it's not, of course, developed. But okay. later on, especially uh, many research suggests that at the age of 10, you get more like an adult-like executive function. But okay. before that, you are somewhere in between. It develops. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And what's okay. interesting about this is when you think about uh, executive functioning and perhaps some of the um, uh, social um, issues we face today you could, yeah, and how it relates, you can think about uh, many states and cities, for instance, are uh, contemplating or have uh, banned such things as texting or talking on the telephone ah, while driving. Okay, okay. And um, that's something that some people might be able to do um, uh, in, an, in an automatic way mm -hmm. and, and, and do it just fine. Sure. But then there are some people like me that even when I'm driving to work, I, it's difficult for me to talk on the phone, sure. impossible for me to text mm -hmm. because it's a controlled uh, action for me. And, and so it's something that would be dangerous for me to do. And, and so, you know, you, you see issues like this where some people will argue texting or talking on the phone, it does not take away from yes, driving. Yes, yes, you hear You know, in some respects, for those people, uh, it may not at all. But then there are other people who may not realize that it actually does or might take away from their uh, concentration on the road. It might convert driving from a from a automatic to a, a controlled um, process for them. Okay. Now, with you saying that, I know this is going to sound like a funny question, but is that something like a skill that can be taught or something that they've picked up? Is it a, a new behavior? Because I'm thinking, you know, people, perhaps people of our age, we're not big on that texting while driving, but some people that we know that might be in our classes, mm -hmm. I mean, they can do that. It's automatic. I think to answer your question, we need to examine the components of executive functioning. Okay. Like okay. One of the major components of executive functioning is cognitive flexibility okay and okay working memory I think this will All help right. us to understand your question good provide an answer to your good. question uh, when we talk about cognitive flexibility it is a function that enables us to act properly in a given situation which is usually a very changing ever changing situation okay so if you don't have that cognitive flexibility you will end up having a very rigid cognitive structure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because of that you will not function properly in society and going back to okay. your uh, question okay I think uh, working memory mm -hmm. is important at this point we all have wor working memory but the capacity of our working memory is different from one individual to another all right all right even with this difference the capacity of our working memory is quite limited so what we can do at a given time is quite limited so we cannot really manage to handle so many things at the same time okay so okay. because it's a working memory and the memory as we all know with age it declines all right so okay with the working memory today, with age it declines probably a for a younger student who can do many things at once okay. but for an older person it might be a little bit difficult to do that okay. but uh, the working memory is the executive and attentional aspect of our 
um, short term memory. Okay. okay. So because it's mm. the, the, it involves attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. It has a huge role in executive functioning. For example, if you look at someone who is forgetful mm -hmm. and doesn't know what he's doing and when he is trying to solve a problem okay. and one aspect of the problem and he's dealing with the one aspect he forgets about the other aspect of the problem yes it causes some uh, memory problem sure so sure it certainly does in return you may end up having a really uh, poor executive function which will make your life quite difficult now you mentioned that cognitive flexibility yes does that change as well cognitive flexibility i mean it is not of course, written in stone. You can okay. work on it All right. to make your cognitive flexibility more efficient. All right. So there are treatments that involve this, like they can um, teach you how to be more flexible, mm -hmm. come up with strategies to be more flexible. Because it is very important. Think about this. When I am talking to you, mm -hmm. I can't really predict what you are going to tell me exactly. I can make some guesses, but right. Right. I will end up having really no clue or maybe not the accurate picture of what you are going to tell me. Mm -hmm. okay. So based on what you are telling me, I have to adjust my cognitive uh, structure mm -hmm. so it will be flexible enough to say for me to say what I want to say okay. plus what I want to say should be based on what you are telling me. <laughs> so if I ignore what you are going to tell me and just focus on what I am going to tell me, mm -hmm this conversation will not be a really it conversation. It's right. going to be monologue. Right, yeah, right. One-way communication. You are saying something and I am saying something and they won't correspond to each other. And it's not going to be a communication. It's just going to be just one-way talk. Yeah, right. and, and we've seen that with some people. Yes, definitely. You know, you know, uh, yeah, if, if someone who, have, who has deficiency in cognitive flexibility, mm -hmm. you will see that they will make like arbitrary comments inappropriate comments when they're talking or they will say things that is not really related to what's going on yes it's out of blue they will just say something and it, it will say okay and that uh, always confuses us yes. at the other end going <laughs> yeah. oh, that, what did i miss you know <laughs> and again because of our own cognitive flexibility yes we're looking at that input going what's happening here yes okay uh, it's okay. a very important ability to have okay and especially when we think about the implication of this uh, cognitive flexibility in mm -hmm. school setting. Imagine you are giving a mathematical problem to a child mm -hmm. and uh, you want that person to solve the problem. Or you are giving a paper for your student to read. All right. And here, there are several things going on. Just because you gave the paper, you it's not the only thing that your working memory is working on. No, it's not. No, no it's not. There's things going on. There's a There's lot going on. A lot yes, going on. And if you don't know which stimuli to inhibit, which stimuli to <sighs> ignore, and which one to focus on, then you are in big trouble. And you we may see not, that. Yes, definitely. You will see like children trying to read. They're actually saying the word, pronouncing the word, right. but they have no clue what's going on in the text. No, that's no, true. Because what's going on is they are unable to inhibit the stimulus around the reading materials. Like for right. they are focusing on maybe something else like the noise of the AC or mm -hmm. the flickering of the lights or, or another any, child. Any minor things or other things that's going on in their environment. Okay. So they cannot really okay. uh, very selective on what to focus on and what not to focus on. So no. it's because they can't filter all the stimulus, okay. they end up having a poor uh, understanding of what's going on. Now when you say that, it, it brings to mind children that have attention problems, children that have learning disabilities, and also I'm reminded of students that say, well I have to listen to music when I study. And you know, then they're attending to several different stimuli. Yes, again, like working memory varies from one person to another. So for an individual, it might be perfect to just listen to music and study okay but if more than couple things going on then it because it it has a, a limit you mm -hmm. know you can't force it okay. it's a biological limit you can't okay. really expand it to an infinite number of things you can't do it all right so it is not plausible to just for, uh, like so many things going on and then you still study it's not 
like physically possible, really. Okay. Because it, you are pushing your working memory a lot. Working memory, it, like, perceives everything. Mm -hmm. So right. you can't really just uh, have so many things going on at the same time. You have to limit it. But, you know, we're in the world today of uh, multitasking. I, you know, I think this is a good place to take a break. So, you know, why don't we do that and we can come back and we can talk about multitasking. Right. Uh, you're watching Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin. Welcome back to the Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin. Today we're talking with our guest, Burhana Tinkeskin, and we're talking about executive function. So let's return to our discussion. Um, Burhana, can, can you tell us some more about the importance of executive function? With any milestone development, to understand how it is important, we need to look at the individual who are lacking this function okay. or ability. Okay. So if you can imagine someone who, whose mental life is chaotic. All right. When you go into his office, it is all messy, and he cannot organize his life. He cannot organize his time. Okay. He is late for interviews or other things, late for class. Okay. So if you imagine someone having this type of deficiencies, you will see how important this executive function is. That's why you will see executive functioning is being associated with many disorders sure. including like Asperger's syndrome okay or uh, obsessive compulsive disorders absolutely sure. yes. learning disability and the and list I, and goes I, on and I'm seeing this with attention deficit disorder yes definitely yes. that's one of the biggest hot topic like attention deficit yes I mean that sounds exactly disorder. like you're describing that yeah, child definitely. or or adult you know that's why there's a, a kind of controversy going on is this ADHD or it's just simply executive dense functioning but could be the same thing right we don't I mean, know we don't know uh, to me uh, it's very difficult to say they are absolutely the same thing okay. but what we or what i know is mm -hmm. that people with adhd they seriously lack this function yes they do yeah uh, because the person that i describe mm -hmm. the person who lacks this function executive function sounded like someone with ADHD. Yes, it did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So m maybe Greg? Well, yeah, it's certainly, uh, uh, we believe very strongly, it's a related component of ADHD. Whether it's the same or not, uh, uh, I don't think that's so much the issue. But, you know, when you look at ADHD, you know, the ADHD is, is basically a disorder uh, where we observe kids being um, particularly impulsive, mm -hmm. uh, being distractive, distracted easily or uh, being hyperactive. Okay. 
And when you think about uh, kids that, have a, that are highly distractible, have a hard time focusing for any length of time on a particular task or a particular object, uh, we see, we, we might uh, talk about them as having a low task commitment. Okay. The commitment to task is quite low. Um, and, and really, the way you can look at it or relate it to executive functioning is um, uh, how it's related to their inability to, uh, uh, how should I say, inhibit responses. Right, right. Inhibit other responses. You know, before we went to the break, uh, I believe, uh, Brahanathan, you were talking about uh, imagining. Uh, that uh, person in a situation where they're unable to filter out outside stimuli. Uh, right, right, um, that screening is gone. Exactly, and, and with kids that are highly distractible, that's exactly what's going on. Sure. They're, they're, it's not that they're not paying attention to anything, it's that they're actually paying attention to so many things. Right, that it, 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 right. It's very easy for them to become distracted by the sound of a bell or by a bird outside or the drop of a pencil that, that they're uh, unable to really focus on a task for any length of time. Yes. Is this related to impulsivity? It, Ab it is how? Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, with impulsivity, again, uh, you've, you're talking about a kid that um, has a hard time um, inhibiting or controlling um, uh, actions, inhibiting what we call inhibition control. Right, And, right. and uh -huh. that's what we're seeing with impulsive kids. Yes. Uh, they're uh, so um, uh, impulsive, they, they have such a difficult time inhibiting their control, uh, their uh, actions, uh, that um, uh, we see in their executive functioning, or we can relate it to their executive functioning, uh, in terms of their attention shifting. Okay. So for instance, right. you've got a kid in a classroom who's listening to the teacher. Uh, if you have a hard time uh, keeping your attention on any one thing, then your attention is more likely to shift onto right. something else. If your attention is more likely to shift onto something else, then it might be very difficult for you to inhibit um, or control your action as it relates to whatever your attention is, might be shifting to. Mm -hmm. So again, would that be an executive function issue? Definitely. Okay. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Because uh, when you are not focusing on your goal behavior, okay, and you are focusing on other stimuli that's all around you, it it has an implication on your behavior because now you are trying to do this, but you can't focus on it, so you try to do other things that mm -hmm. are not related to this task. Okay. So you switch from one behavior to another, one behavior to another, right? Which from an outsider, it's Looks like this seen as impulsive. You know? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. All you right. know, we talk about um, uh, executive functioning is also uh, affecting uh, uh, people in terms of their need to overcome uh, habitual response, uh, uh, as we might say. And what we're talking about there is um, the ability for somebody who's used to responding in a certain way okay. to when some parameter changes in the situation to inhibit or control that automatic response and respond more appropriately. Okay. Let me, let me try to All give right. you a better, yeah, take that better example yeah. uh, or an example of that to help better explain it. Um, uh, when you're driving to work, mm -hmm. you, you take a certain route every day. Absolutely. And you go that same route every day and it becomes, as I said at the beginning of the show, an automatic uh, response, something you don't really even think about. And, and then you find yourself maybe on a Saturday on your way to the hardware store. Mm -hmm. And so you pull out of your driveway, uh, you take a right as you normally would on a Friday um, to go to work and you uh, get a call. Right. And so you uh, answer the phone and as you're driving, you're talking on the phone. Yes. <laughs> and um, you might actually end up driving to work because your executive uh, functioning uh, is such that you've moved from again a automatic uh, action to a controlled action okay. and you're having a hard time inhibiting the automatic response of just driving to work. Excellent, okay. You know, we see yeah. this with kids. Another example would be a simple Simon Says game. Mm -hmm. uh, in Simon Says, what, what you have are uh, kids who are mimicking the mm -hmm. actions of, of the leader, leader mm -hmm. right? And so they mimic the ideas, they mimic the action when the leader says, Simon says. Okay. And they're, they're supposed to inhibit mimicking that action when uh, the leader does something but, but doesn't provide that verbal cue of yes. Simon says. And so it's a, it, you learn very quickly as the leader to lull them into this false sense of security <laughs> by saying, Simon says, touch your toes. Simon says, do B. Simon says, do C. And, and what happens then is kids start, who are playing along, um, start 
giving the automatic response. The automatic response just being just mimicking what the leader is saying. They quit listening to the cue of Simon Says. And then suddenly when, after saying Simon Says do E, then the leader just does F without saying Simon <laughs> Says. And every half the people might do it. Right, and, and, right. And what you're seeing there then is uh, difficulty overcoming that habitual response of just doing what the leader is, is doing. Mm -hmm. they, that's become an automatic process for them. Okay. They're having a difficult time inhibiting that response. I see, okay. And also I was thinking about like the cognitive flexibility. Yes. It uh, results in not being able to adjust yourself to the situation that is ever changing. Mm -hmm. uh, how about like a social implication of being not able to like not able to have cognitive flexibility. Do you think okay. this yeah. will have like some social implication? You know, just when you brought up that issue, you knew there were some social implications. Yes. Pe people that can't adapt yeah, to yeah. any changes in their environment. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. We see, and you know, that's uh, a source of, or that could be a source of uh, social skills difficulty with kids with oh, ADHD. Oh, absolutely. Um, who are impulsive, who are highly distractive, who um, are not so flexible in, in their thinking. Okay, and, okay. And, uh, you know, as, as um, Brahanatan, you pointed out, flexibility in thinking has a lot to do with how you interact with someone when you're going to have a conversation. You might have something planned out in your head in terms of how the conversation is going to go, but then uh, very quickly that could change based on the response of your communication partner or partners. And you have to be flexible enough to change with that conversation to uh, continue to respond in what would be a socially appropriate way. Kids that have a difficult time doing that, uh, kids with ADHD right. that might have right. some executive functioning issues, right. uh, when I say issues, perhaps delays in their development of their executive functioning. Kids okay. with autism who might have delays in the development of their executive functioning uh, might not be as flexible when their communication partner doesn't react the way they had initially planned. And so then their response um, may become very inappropriate very quickly because their flexibility of thought is 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 not functioning the way it should. It doesn't fit into the situation yeah, because absolutely. they weren't able to anticipate absolutely. a change. Now, when you mention the whole social skills thing, what it tells me is social skills for most of us are an automatic response. And the kids that do not have social skills, it's something that they have not you know, made part of their automatic response. Is that true? Is that how you would I, look at it? Or? I think like... Uh, social skills when someone lacks this yes. skills uh, it is again related to cognitive flexibility and okay. working memory too okay so okay when you're in a conversation again if you cannot focus on the person who is speaking then you're gonna end up saying what you want to say anyway right so you will end up saying something inappropriate to the conversation Total, totally on the context so this will turn you into an someone with antisocial behavior traits. Okay, okay. And another one is the cognitive flexibility. If your uh, mind mm -hmm. is arranged in a way that it's not flexible, it's rigid. Okay. That means you can perceive things only from a white and black perspective. You Wh may not have a gray area. Okay. So you can easily label someone as good or bad and you may not just fo And uh, And we do see that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we sure do. And that, so that fits in. Th right. So that as a result, m turn you into an antisocial person. Because Certainly. if you see things from only bad or good or just in two-dimensional version, then you can't really have a lot of friends or you can't really function properly. Well, and you certainly couldn't relate to strangers or new people that you met because you, you wouldn't be equipped to do that. Yeah. Um, is there anything that can be done to train people in such things as executive function or... Well, absolutely. You know, an important piece of this, Bahanatin uh, mentioned at the beginning of the show, is the fact that um, uh, executive functioning is a developmental process. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's something kids develop over time, kids learn over time, and uh, it's, an, it's an important reason that we, we work to understand better executive functioning, because if we understand it better, then we might have a better um, angle at uh, helping kids develop executive okay. functioning, okay. especially those kids that are atypical in terms of their development. So, uh, but to, to get back to your question, so with regard to what can be done to help kids develop executive functioning, 
uh, we do have programs, uh, for instance, social skills training programs, where, um, where we teach kids uh, perhaps scripts at first, yes, uh, interactional scripts, mm -hmm. and then we vary those scripts a bit as they learn to use those scripts and become a little more automatic about okay. it. Uh, okay. We vary their communication partners, we vary the responses, and we help them, we talk them through um, uh, how they might become more flexible in their thought, how they might flex their own responses based on the responses of their communication partners. Sure. And in so doing then, develop that flexibility of thought uh, that would be important, for instance, in, in communicating with another individual. You know, and, and I was thinking about that whole social skills aspect uh, prior to and as you answered that. Um, again, one of our problems that we typically have with kids with behavior disorders is that lack of social skills. And, but we also find that social skills training is very ineffective with that group. That we could teach them social skills in the classroom, in that controlled environment, but when we take them outside of that, it just does not generalize. Absolutely, and I think what we're seeing there is, a, is an excellent example of, of how difficult it can be for some uh, uh, kiddos to have that flexibility of thought, to be able to, to, to go in a completely different situation and generalize or use those skills that we developed in the classroom mm -hmm. to a situation that might uh, seem very, very different to them out on the, on the playground, right. playing a game of basketball or something like that. Or back in their home environment where that behavior is discouraged or not reinforced, and that would cause some problems there. Absolutely. I think, also, uh, sorry, you go ahead. You know, I just want to say, I think what's important about this is that we, we understand that it is a developmental process, and uh, kids that are, are lacking in their uh, executive functioning development, okay. um, these are real skills that, yes. that we need to teach kids. It's it's not so much kids being lazy or not using skills they already have, but it's, it requires real instruction of skills. And, and, and what's important about that then is as a teacher, as a therapist, mm -hmm. or, or um, psychologist, that you, um, it, it helps direct the, uh, you to the type of intervention you might use. For instance, you would shy away from behavioral therapies. Right. Uh, where, you, where you might be assuming that they have skills you just need to encourage them to use skills. When in fact they don't. When in fact they don't have okay. skills. So okay. you can reinforce them all day long to use a skill, but if they don't have that skill, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Which is them. one of those misconceptions we have. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And so uh, it's, it's important for teachers to have a real good understanding of what uh, executive functioning is so that when they look at a student, they understand, okay, we're looking at a skill set here we have yes, to teach. Yes. And not just encouraging the student um, to use it and then when the student doesn't use that, punishing them in some way, shape, and, or and that's that assumption we often see in teachers where they assume everybody knows the right thing to do, yeah. but they just they don't. They're not motivated. Yeah. Cool. When you gave the example of like teaching children uh, skills in yes. classroom, it may work in classroom, but outside it may not work. Right. I think I see a pattern uh, involving working memory. Because okay, in the okay. Closed classroom environment, it is a kind of a controlled environment, oh, so you can very much so. yeah. train the child to handle the stimuli mm -hmm. going on in that classroom. But when you go out, it is again a heavy workload on your working memory, okay. which okay. may result in again like dysfunctioning. Yes, because yes. it's too much to handle. You know, controlled environment it might be easier because there's less stimulation. Less stimulation. And okay. You know okay. the people. You know you can predict what they are going to do, okay. so you can adjust your behavior accordingly, but when you are out there, it's unknown. There's too many inputs. Too, yeah, yeah, too many, okay. so it's too much on your plate to handle. You know, I relate some of this to my own life. Uh, I'm a motorcyclist. Uh, one of the things I always talk about when you're riding is you have to limit your world. Mm -hmm. You have to limit everything you do. You have to attend to the moment. Because otherwise you die, you know, and I, I see <laughs> it that way. Let, let's take a break here. Uh, you're on the Education Forum.
brings you programming from the faculty, students, and staff in the College of Education and Health Professions. Learn more about our programs, admissions, initiatives, and other informative events by tuning into our webcast presented live from the studio located in Jordan Hall on COEHP TV. You're watching COEHP TV. We're back on the Education Forum uh, with my guest, Burhanatan Keskin, and we're talking about executive function. Uh, Justin, if you could bring up the Stroop test for us, please. Okay, so we're going to take a look at a way that we can uh, sort of test executive functioning within ourselves. And so what I'd like you to do is, is look at these um, words, and you'll notice these words are all uh, in various colors. And as you look at it, what I'm going to ask you to do as a viewer is to call the color of the ink in which the word is written as fast as you can. So you're not going to read the word, you're just going to call out the color uh, of the word as fast as you can. So go ahead and just try to do that out loud right now. Okay, so um, Hopefully, uh, you did that. Uh, you probably saw that it was, it was actually quite difficult to call the correct color um, rather than, than reading the word. And, and that's, that's an example of, of how difficult it can be to inhibit an automatic response. As uh, fluent readers, um, our yeah. automatic response is to look at the word, and even though we're asked, specifically not to read the word, but to simply call out the color of the word, mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. our automatic response is very difficult to inhibit. Oh, and so is. more likely it than is. not, maybe you did it correctly the first two words, but then you dropped into your automatic response and you found yourself starting to read the word and then starting to stumble as you tried to figure out what to do it next. It slowed you right down, or you had to you really right put down. some effort into it. You, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I think and the question is like, are you cognitively flexible enough to ignore the meaning of the word. Okay. So whenever, uh, if you know how to read, whenever you see a word, you just read it, no yes. matter if you pay attention or not. Mm -hmm. So are you f cognitively flexible enough to ignore the meaning of the uh, word, which is the prepotent stimuli? It's very strong. Mm -hmm. It's there, very, it's very yeah. strong. And you need to eliminate that and focus on the color. So in like social life, and you th think about the implication of this, okay. you may see that are very appealing to you, but you know that you are not supposed to do that at that time. You're not supposed to do it. Right. But are right. you going to be able to ignore that pro potent, like very strong stimuli okay. that's coming to you, ignore it and then say, no, I'm not going to do it. Absolutely. Like well, when you are hungry, for example, I'm right. very hungry and right. I see a piece of cake there. Sure. And the natural thing for me to take a bite. Certainly. But am I going to be uh, cognitively flexible enough to change my mindset saying that even though it is there and I am hungry and I'm going to, uh, I should be eating, okay. but it's not an appropriate behavior in this sure. context. So ignore that stimuli okay. and focus on other things that are relevant. Now, we do see sometimes with older people how all of a sudden that seems to change. Um, and they no longer have that flexibility, and if they see that cake, <laughs> they have no impulse control there. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a reversion back, isn't it? Yeah, like, like when we talk about flexibility, yes. you know, okay. with maturation, this flexibility can decline easily. Oh, all right, like, all right. Think about a tree, you know, at mm -hmm. the beginning, it is very flexible. Mm -hmm. When the tree grows, the trunk gets harder and harder. It right. becomes less flexible. Yes. It's true for our mental life, too. If it's not true for everybody, but mm -hmm. it's f for general public, it is true. When you get old, your cognitive structure tends okay. to get inflexible. It's okay. not flexible okay. as it was before. So when it is not flexible, you cannot adjust yourself to a new situation, or you cannot uh, be very receptive to new ideas. All right. You are not cognitively flexible to receive new Cause ideas. Because we've, lo we've lost that ability. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Now, is that... You know, the, one of the things I've read about and I've heard about is mental gymnastics, 
where we're trying to get people to do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, driving to work a different way, mm -hmm. uh, eating with the opposite hand, doing everything uh -huh. with your opposite hand, um, puzzles, things of that nature. That's to make you more cognitively flexible. Yes, definitely, okay. because you are like uh, trying to swim against the current. But okay. you can do it. Okay. It's not going to do a major impact, but it is. No? It is. No? I think to me, it's going to slow down this process <sighs> because it's biologically. I mean, you okay. can't go back to the previous stage. No, like no. The, the tree can't go back to being little again. Yes, you okay. can't. I mean, you All can't right. be as flexible as when you were like very young. But you, what you can do, you can slow down the process. And what we know now that we can slow down this process but we cannot eliminate it because with maturation with getting old okay it's, it's inevitable so far what we know okay know. but and that also might explain why when we see older people that have become less flexible they're more comfortable with sameness yes sameness even to different ideas like if yes. you tell them a different yes. idea they're not very into new ideas no, they just want no. comfort what they already know they're not very receptive to new ideas because the, with age, cognitive flexibility declines, so you can't really adjust to new situation. Because when you are introduced a new idea, right. that's like a whole world. You need to rearrange your world like again. Like the, the paradigm shift that we keep hearing about. Yeah, this is like you, you, ha you have a lot of things to change. Mm -hmm. and it is always comforting for us to stick with what we have oh. versus the other new thing, novel right, thing right. that requires change. And you know, and I, I, and I also have to add to that. Uh, I have to argue that a big piece of the, of what we're talking about is this uh, difficulty with um, controlling habitual response. Okay. You know, okay. As, as we grow, as we get older, um, our experiences help inform us, and we do become creatures of habit. Yes, we and, do. And yeah. You know, part of that mental gymnastics, whether you know, driving a different way to work. Again, what we're doing, swimming against that tide, that mm -hmm. tide being that, that very habitual way of acting. Yes. Um, and, and providing us with uh, some flexibility to try to fight that habitual response that we might have developed as we get older. And, and you know, it is difficult, but not impossible. Now, you know, listening to you guys talk, I, being older than the two of you, I see that happening <laughs> with myself, that mental flexibility. All of a sudden I'm saying, you know, sameness is a good thing. Yeah, I, I can assure you that many of, of, of us, your colleagues, see that with oh, you as, thank you. as yeah, well, because it's much great. more yeah, yeah. Uh, flexible <laughs> I, I appreciate as the that, days yeah. go on. <laughs> like this show, well, we're, we're going to do the same topic next week absolutely. because I feel good about it. You yeah. know? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Comforting, huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, but it, it's, it's interesting how... Um, we know that uh, there are uh, some connections between executive functioning and various forms of disability. Okay. Uh, yeah, we need to really jump back into what we were talking about earlier. For instance, uh, we relate executive dysfunction mm -hmm. with ADHD, and as oh, Brahantin, Brahantin said earlier, that uh, you know uh, we talk about ADHD, we talk about uh, executive dysfunction, and are this, are they the same? And we spoke on that a bit, and. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind is we do see with kids with ADHD some evidence um, of, of uh, executive dysfunction. We, we see, sure do. Um, prefront prefrontal uh, lobes in the brain. Um, we see those prefrontal lobes with uh, differences in terms of how the, ac the mylation occurs on mm -hmm. the axioms, mm -hmm. the axioms being uh, the little the transmitters of, of electricity that yes. Uh, seem to indicate thought uh, in a brain. Uh, we see depletion of neurochemicals such okay. as dopamine. Right. A uh, major reason that we use Ritalin, for instance, to, uh, stimulate. to, to treat yeah. kids with ADHD and different types of, of medications is uh, we're trying to adjust for different levels of neurotransmitters neurotrans okay. in the brain. And uh, so we we, we definitely see a link between between executive dysfunction and such things as ADHD. How and about the, the association between the executive dysfunction and autism? Can you? Oh, I think that's a that's a good one. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's it, it's an important piece mm -hmm. because remember that executive dysfunction, as we've been talking about, deals with flexibility of thought. It deals with working memory. Um, these are things that affect kids not just with ADHD, but we see kids with intellectual disabilities 
uh, by definition, kids with intellectual disabilities um, have uh, uh, a lower, much more difficult for them to remember things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's part of, part different. of the disability, sure. Um, kids with learning disabilities, um, we see some inflexibility in thought. We, we see them having trouble um, figuring out how to organize themselves. Yes, yes, um, fits right in. Yeah. see kids with autism, who autism, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, is a disability that's very uh, firmly related to social interaction or poor social interaction. As it's we everything. talked about executive yes. dysfunction here, um, it's that social interaction difficulty that can help define a kid as, as having autism or an autistic spectrum disorder. Yes. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good explanation. I, what, what I also see, though, is the connection with mental illness and with that lack of flexibility in thinking. Yes. You know? If you see the world black and white, yes, you know. that's well, not a good picture. Your typical obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. I mean, that's the world. It, it's you know, yeah. scary place. That's an inflexible, very yeah. infle uh, It's a very, very scary inflexible. place when it, you have to get out of that. And you have to have a certain like way of living. Everything has to be at the same place. You know, there's no flexibility. If you move something like this. Let me move that back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. The person gets right. irritated. Yes. Uh, oh, so very there's much no so. flexibility going on. And also, going back to the uh, children with autism, mm -hmm. and I think this cognitive inflexibility plays a huge role in uh, children with autism because they cannot really carry on a conversation. No, they if can't. You, right. If you are not flexible cognitively, what you are going to say and what the other person will say will not correspond. And the person will be talking to you and then you will be distracted by other things and then this cannot be called a regular conversation. No, no. And, and you see that very typically with yes. your kids with autism. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. I think what's important out of all of this is that as um, teachers or uh, other professionals that are concerned with um, helping kids develop executive functioning, uh, that is there are strategies that we that we know work that we can use. Oh, um, let's talk about those, please. Uh, yeah. So, for instance, in in classrooms, mm -hmm. we might uh, use strategies such that um, we're going to help kids uh, manage their own time, uh, so that they can plan and predict and carry out processes. Okay. Um, okay. We might teach them to use uh, some sort of timekeeper, a mm -hmm. day planner, for instance. We and, might and provide overt instruction on how to use something like that in order to manage tasks over a period of time. And we've been doing that in the schools. Uh, you know, we give all the kids the planners and, and that's required part of their education now is using their planner and they even have to hand in their planners. So, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's a piece of that. You know, we teach kids now how to take notes. The process of note taking, of listening for cues, deciding what cue is important to write down, then deciding to write it down and yes. and, and write it in a way that that, that the the student he or she understands mm -hmm. um, what they're writing, what the meaning is behind what they're writing, um, uh, and also I think it is important because the uh, people with executive dysfunction they have a kind of mental chaos. Okay. Okay. So it reflects on their environment. So you oh, see chaos certainly. in the physical environment. Mm -hmm. So I in a classroom setting, I as a teacher, if you uh, become more uh, attentive to the arrangement of the things, mm -hmm. if things are properly stored, and if you turn that classroom into a more organized environment, I think this is going to have some implication on the cognitive Excellent. Okay. side okay. too. Because okay. when you see an organized world, mm -hmm. it's more likely, or it makes your job easier to organize your mental states. And you don't have to worry about those yes. things as well. Yes, you can because it raises stress level of mm -hmm. yours. Because if you see a chaos right. outside, you are already very uh, like meticulous about other stimulus that bother you and, and, and you cannot uh, focus on single thing. If you see a chaos, okay. it's like the perfect environment to be distracted. Yes, so it is. If you turn that environment into a more organized place, you are helping the child to organize his or her mental structure. You know, you bring that up and that reminds me of what we did in residential treatment with children. And that was to put routine and structure into their lives. And we found that was a major component to treatment. Mm -hmm. More than the behavioral programming or the counseling was just putting some structure in their lives so they can start dealing with other things. I think when you said this, I 
uh, remembered Montessori mm. right. when she was working with children with behavioral problems. First yes. thing she did was create a very structured environment. Yes. People criticize her saying that you know there's no uh, creativity going on, but we have to think about the children who she was dealing with. Yes, you exactly. have to provide yeah. a very structured environment so they can m manage their physical environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as a reflection of that their mental world and they can, then they can deal with their mental they can world because they it don't and have they to can deal move with it yes definitely and, and that's you know the exact model that we used and it was very effective very initially. control control of error it just gives you power to be more powerful over your environment yes so okay. when you are powerful over your environment it's like a standing point for you and then you can stand from there and then try to organize your mental world it's like this when you watch a beautiful view yes. you feel like a good feeling inside yes of you. Okay. But if you look at a clutter, like a very chaotic <laughs> environment, you don't feel that good. No, you don't. Because a physical environment has an influence on our psychology plus our cognitive structures. Right. So the same thing. If you uh, prepare a nice environment, organized environment, it's definitely going to help you. I agree. Uh, I afraid we're going to have to stop the conversation here. All right. Um, I would like to thank Burhanatan Keskin for being on the show today. And of course, my co-host, Greg Blaylock. This is the Education Forum. I'm Jeff Conklin. The Education Forum is a production of the studio in the College of Education and Health Professions at Columbus State University, Columbus, Georgia. Executive producer, Tom Hackett. The director, Chief Cat Herder, and birthday boy is Michael Baltimore. This was produced by Jeff Conklin with help from Greg Blaylock. Camera and sound technicians today are Justin Bakuti and Kenneth Grant.